For the first time in nearly 100 years, LCBO workers are on strike. Good evening and thank you for joining us. In a historic move, thousands of liquor store workers across the province hit the picket line today. It's the first strike in the 97-year history of the LCBO. Lee Noonan was out speaking with local picketers today and she joins us in studio. Lee? Thanks, Riley. As we speak, there are workers picketing in front of the Thunder Centre LCBO. They've been out there since noon today and the folks we spoke with say they're really committed to staying on strike until they can get a deal they feel good about. This is the first ever LCBO strike. Spirits are high with the picketers here, but local union mobilizer Mo Marcinet says they would really rather not be making history this way. Nobody's excited about being uh, out on strike. We'd rather be at work serving the people of Ontario. Um, but we're passionate about protecting um, the public revenue that the LCBO generates for the province. $2.5 billion last year went back into the public coffers and we'd like to protect that. Marcinet says privatization is the biggest sticking point in the negotiations, not only because of the loss of public funding, but also because jobs could be lost and smaller rural LCBOs could be shut down entirely. Geraldton, Long Lac, uh, out west to Fort Francis, Rainy River, west to Kenora and Vermilion Bay, Dryden. So, I mean, these are small communities, right? And so these are good jobs for those communities uh, and good, those good jobs could be lost. And Makala is bargaining unit manager at the liquor store in Kakabeka. She's worried about her staff's job security. If they get like the gas stations there and the grocery store they're selling, they're not going to need us open as much because all we're going to have is hard liquor, right? Like the spirits. So yeah, it is a worry for us. It's a worry for my staff. I have five staff out there, including myself. So, I mean, it could be just me and a couple of casuals working after this. According to the union, 70% of LCBO workers are casual. And changing that is another priority for them. Gary Kemp is one of those workers, even though he's been at the LCBO for nearly a decade. It's really difficult. You start off, you have to make a commitment to be available to work, but they have no obligation to schedule you to work. So it can get really lean. Um, there's no guarantee of hours at all. I mean, there's, there's times that you make the choice as to whether you're going you're gonna to eat or pay the rent. The strikers want more full-time positions and more permanent part-time positions to give workers like Kemp a chance at stable jobs. Marcinette says she hopes they'll be back to the bargaining table soon, but in the meantime, they're grateful for the support they're seeing from the Thunder Bay public. <laughs> Lee Noonan, TBT News. More than 9,000 LCBO workers in total are on the picket line today. CTV's John Musselman brings us more on the situation across the province. Thousands of LCBO workers are on the picket line across the province after the union and the government-owned liquor agency failed to reach a deal. OPSU, the union representing 9,000 workers, entered a legal strike position at midnight. Lines went up at this LCBO warehouse in Whitby. It's not necessarily about not providing convenience for the public, it's about what the impact would be to those employees who uh, have precarious work. We're talking about $2.5 in revenue that would disappear from public health care and education and go into private corporations. We're not talking about mom and pop shops. We're talking about Costco, Loblaws, you know, giant grocery chains, giant convenience store chains. The union is fighting for better wages and more full-time positions. It's also concerned about job losses with the expansion of alcohol sales into other retail outlets like convenience stores. The union says it doesn't oppose the policy, but the province has made no guarantees employees won't be affected. So even after seven, eight, nine years working with the board, um, being a supervisor of sections, um, being a shift leader, all kinds of things, uh, that doesn't actually get us any job security. Job security is, is number one, uh, so that's what we're fighting for and that's why I'm down here uh, supporting everyone here. The government expressed disappointment. A strike has begun. We have engaged in collective bargaining with OPSU in hopes of reaching a fair and equitable agreement that addresses their considerations while ensuring the long-term sustainability of our operations. Despite our best efforts, we have not yet been able to do so. The LCBO says it offered pay increases and 400 casual workers would be converted to full-time. 
As for customers, the LCBO says it will reopen about 32 stores after 14 days, but the stores will offer limited hours. The LCBO says its warehouses will also remain open during the strike, but delivery trucks will be met by picket lines. I don't think so they are going to unload me. The province says residents can still purchase beer and wine at retail locations like grocery stores. And that was CTV's John Musselman reporting. Highway 17 near Rossport has been closed for most of the day due to a fatal crash involving a transport. It happened just before 5 o'clock this morning at Cavers Hill. Officers from the Nipigon OPP detachment along with paramedics and volunteer fire crews from Scriber, Terrace Bay and Nipigon were all on the scene today. The transport appears to have veered off the highway and crashed down a steep embankment before later catching on fire. OPP confirmed at least one person has been pronounced dead, and eyewitnesses say there may also be a second victim. The flames from the burning vehicle spread to the forest, and it took fire crews several hours to bring it under control. The highway reopened to one lane, alternating traffic at 5 o'clock. The revitalization work on the Vickers Park playground will be finished just in time for next, week te next week's teddy bears picnic. It's all part of an effort to make the space more accessible. And yes, it'll still include the beloved turtle. Vasilios Bellos has more. A new look for a historic Southside playground. Arguably one of the older parks in the former Fort William. The revamp work on the Vickers Park playground is just days away from completion and will be ready for this year's teddy bear picnic happening on Tuesday. While the structure will look much different once completed, the beloved turtle will still be a prominent piece at the playground. New features include play equipment focused on movement and a rubber surface rather than gravel. Parks and Open Spaces Supervisor Werner Schwarz says replacing the old equipment ensures all kids can play. It was not really uh, inclusive or accessible, right? And since that time, standards have changed and with Boulevard Lake in the north end of the park, we created an accessible, inclusive hub. So the idea was to create an accessible, inclusive hub for the south end of the, the city here at Vickers Park. The project is on budget, with the city estimating costs to be $1.1 million. Schwar goes on to explain that color choice on the playground is meant to improve safety as well. Darker color to make people aware that there's a like a swinging or a motion going on. The outside of the rubber surface is defined by a, a tan band similar to Boulevard and again that gives a color differentiation for people to with part of sight. While the play structure will be ready for next week's teddy bear picnic, there's more work to come here at Vickers Park. That includes accessible parking spots and a concrete walkway into the play structure. Vicioios Bolos, CBT News. Residents will have the opportunity to get up close to a historic airplane this weekend as a vintage Canso aircraft will be on display at the Wasea hangar. The airplane was built in Cartierville, Quebec in 1943 and was previously used as a Second World War submarine hunter. After the war, it was converted to a water bomber and fought fires from Newfoundland to the Northwest Territories. The plane is available to view from 11 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday. Visitors of all ages are invited to learn about the plane's history and get a tour inside. Gary Wieben, one of the aircraft's captains, says the plane has a long history and they're hoping to hear a lot of the stories this weekend. That is an all-Canadian story. This plane has been connected to Canada for 80 years. All the people behind it, all the stories that come out when, when we're, we're touring around, there's so many people that were touched by this airplane and, and so we want to get it out there and, and hear those stories. It has a timeless effect on, on, on the future in a way. Not only did it rescue people, uh, but it, uh, it also put out fires uh, in the forests and it also uh, did search and rescue uh, on both coasts of Canada. This weekend's event is one of two being hosted by the Northwestern Ontario Aviation Centre in celebration of the Royal Canadian Air Force's 100th anniversary. A mission is by donation only. 
A young golfer from Nipigon lost his vision back in 2020, but that hasn't stopped him from pursuing his dreams. 23-year-old Hayden Folds is headed to the Canadian Blind Golf Open Championships in British Columbia this weekend. He was at Northern Lights Golf Course earlier today for his final practice session ahead of the tournament. Nev Van Pelt has the story. Born blind in his left eye and experiencing complete vision loss in 2020, Hayden Fold's golfing journey has been an inspiring one, to say the least. Four years ago, I was at the lowest point of my life, thinking things would never really get better. And I think with a lot of support around me, it kind of built me up back to this point. And anyone who's in thinks their current situation isn't the greatest. I mean, things can always get better with the right mindset and the right people around you. And if I got out one person, I think that's special. The 23-year-old from Nipigon is competing in his first Canadian Blind Golf Open Championship and has been training for this moment for over two years. Not only did I surprise myself, but I surprised others in how fast I was kind of accelerating the process of golfing again. And I don't know if I'm necessarily better than I was before, but I feel more confident. Folds has been training with local golf pro Jamie DePiero. Their lessons started in a simulator and progressed to ranges and courses which has allowed him to build the confidence to compete in blind golf events. DePiro said setting up the golf ball is completely different for Folds and spoke about this process. Example would be even on the putting green when he's trying to understand how hard to hit it. We have to be pretty precise with, um, with the distance so he can actually get an idea in his head how, how much force he needs to put behind it. All 48 golfers in the upcoming tournament are paired with a sighted guide who assists with gauging distances, choosing the right club, and ensuring proper ball position and body alignment. Fold's father, David, will be joining him on the Bootleg Gap golf course on Sunday. He'll make the final decision on what club he wants to hit, all I can suggest to him. Uh, my main goal is setting him up and seeing where he's hitting the ball that day. If he's uh, hitting behind the ball or ahead of the ball, then we adjust and, uh, yeah, and just setting him up properly and let him do his thing. The young golfer says his support system has been instrumental in building him up to this point and he's looking forward to this experience. Obviously, I want to shoot the lowest score possible, but being at be my first tournament, I think I'm just excited for the experience and the opportunity to meet new people with similar barriers. Nev Van Pelt, TBT News. More than a dozen brewers have begun pouring frosty beverages down at Port Arthur's Landing for this year's Bruja Festival. Thousands of people are expected to head down to try the 17 beverage vendors. The 2024 installment features a number of local favorites, along with popular brewers from outside the region. There will be nine food vendors at the waterfront to pair with the beverages. The Chamber of Commerce is once again taking the lead on this year's installment. President Charlotte Robinson says you don't have to be a beer lover to enjoy the event. Non-alcoholic, we've got, uh, you know, all of the different types of craft brewery that you could think of. We've got cider, we've got wine. So whatever your, your, your beverage of choice is, we have it here. 40 different flavors and a couple of great local bands as well. So it's a great, uh, great time to come out and enjoy some uh, wonderful brews and food and music at the waterfront. Bruja runs until 9 p.m. tonight and again tomorrow from 4 to 9. Tickets are available on the Bruja website. A lot of people will be down there enjoying that event, Absolutely. to be sure. All right, let's turn our attention to the weather now, Fiona. And that, uh, i got to be honest, that graphic behind you surprises me a little <laughs> bit. I was out earlier in the day. It was absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I didn't even realize that we had gotten some rain. Yes, uh, it actually was quite dry until about mid-afternoon, and we've had a couple of brief uh, showers, we'll call them. Uh, but temperature-wise... High of 23, Humidex hovering around 28, so a little bit of rain probably helped cool things off just a bit. Winds were very light, just 3 to 14 kilometers an hour. Now, the system, for the most part, hitting the eastern portions of Lake Superior the hardest, especially Sault Ste. Marie and Wawa. In our region, just a few pop-ups in the last little bit, but for the most part, it's been fairly dry. Fort Francis, loads of sunshine at this hour, and they're currently at 25, but the Humidex, that's making it feel like 29. Uh, similar temperatures up into Red Lake, where they've had just a few clouds. 
but they haven't been dealing with the Humidex values kicking in, so it hasn't felt as hot and sticky and maybe a little bit muggy as you head a little bit further north. But the temperatures are well within seasonal values. Greenstone started out with loads of sunshine. They've just started to add a few more clouds into the region around 3 o'clock. That started. And in Sault Ste. Marie, well, they've been dealing with rain showers all day. No surprise since you just saw the radar that was moving through most of the day. And as you can see, quite a bit cooler. 18 in the Sioux at this hour, 19 in Wawa, which is pretty much the high for the days for those areas. Tonight we'll drop down to a low of 12, just like last night. And just like last night, there is a risk of a thunderstorm this evening, about a 60% chance of a shower this evening. But once we pass that risky period, then skies are going to start to clear and that's going to set the stage for a sunny start to Saturday. But as we look into the weekend ahead, the afternoon will see increasing clouds. So we're look, left with a mix of sun and cloud for both Saturday and Sunday. Those high humidex levels, those are going to stick around. So if folks are at uh, Bruja, they're probably going to want to enjoy their beverages to cool things off. Unfortunately, the risk of showers and pop-up thunderstorms also continues. So it's going to be one of those weekends you should probably bring sunscreen, a hat, keep it a collapsible umbrella nearby, and just go out and enjoy it because it seems like anything can happen over the next couple of days. Okay, Mother Nature seems very confused right now, but we'll take She's it. She's keeping us on our toes. She is. She's keeping us on our toes. Thank you so much, Fiona. Well, when we come back, we will start in the UK, where after 14 years, the Conservatives were beaten by a landslide by the Labour Party. We'll have more on that as your Friday News Hour continues. This will take a while, but have no doubt that the work of change begins immediately.